we have in the scripture accounts we have some accounts that are very tender what I mean among the saints we have some accounts that are very tender moments one of those is when Peter that was arrested. It was held in prison. That that night, the angel uh, freed him, and he and he and the brother knew what was going on. They got together and they prayed. He he came there, and there was Peter at the door. A very tender moment. And another one though that that's a very tender moment is when Paul called the uh, the elders together in Ephesus, and they met there. And in my mind, I think they're right there on the beach, probably. He's getting ready to depart from them, and he and he's right there with them, and he tells them, "Take heed unto." thee unto the, yourselves and to all the flock. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves men shall arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. Now, that was the situation then. That's the situation today. Now what we got in, uh, in what's going on here, Paul's had an address, this very thing. And the Church, at the congregation at Corinth. Men have come in, and they've come in with a kind of thinking that opposes the way God thinks. And, and it's caused all kind of problems. And so, now Paul has addressed this. And he's and and, and uh, a couple of weeks ago, we dealt with the first five verses in the second chapter. How Paul said that, you know, when I came to you, I, he, he told them how I came. He, he told them... You remember what he said. And so now he's going he's to continue in the same thought. We're going to pick it up here at verse 6. Now, uh, we can see now how the... And we got this kind of problem today. You know, where wisdom of the world has crept in to the thinking of the saints. And so, you know, we can see here how the Spirit addresses this kind of a situation. And we see it right here, how Paul addressed the situation. We see how a man of God will come in and, and do it. Um, and, and so, to say it plainly then, we see how the Spirit of God will address the situation when the wisdom of men has penetrated the assembly of the saints. Now, Paul has already confirmed to them that the Spirit of God did do a work in them. He's already confirmed that. The testimony of God was declared among you, among them, and the testimony of God was confirmed in them, and the, uh, the grace of God that came by way of Jesus Christ enriched them in all utterances and knowledge. They, became, they, be, uh, they were behind in no gift. They came behind in no gift. Paul said the Lord is willing to confirm them unto the end that they may be blameless at the time of His coming. Now that's, that's, just, that's God's uh, side of it. That's what God is, that's what Paul is telling them. But now, because they've lost sight of this, Paul had to make known to it, <coughs> he's had to clear this up to them again, you see. And uh, so, he wants to bring them to see. It's all a work of God. That's where he's He's making a difference between what, they, what they're pursuing now and what they at, at one time taking a hold of. This is the work of God. And it's, it's not something I did, Paul says. It's, uh, it's not something, it's, it's something that God done. It was a response. Paul goes on to say it was a response uh, to the message I preached and to the word that you believed and received. This is, this is the outcome of that. When I came, I didn't preach what was on my mind. Or I didn't preach any kind of other kind of wisdom that, come, that comes from this world. But he said, I preach a wisdom uh, that comes from God. Yeah. Jesus Christ and Him crucified is what he said. Paul continues to make the case in this chapter. And this is the kind of thing that's, uh, that's going on at Corinth. And, it's, and it comes from the wisdom of men. And that we know that this is the kind of thing, this is the kind of situation you have when the wisdom of the world comes in. Uh, so Paul, he, he exhorts them quite profoundly. Be perfectly joined together and in the same mind and judgment and not divided. See, so you can see the contrast here. And so uh, he wanted the brother to see to do otherwise or to be otherwise is really contrary to the wisdom of God. This letter couldn't be any more fitting today than it was for Carl. You could get it, we address the same problems today. James says, Who is a wise man and a dude with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not 
It lied not against the truth. This wisdom descended not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace." Man's wisdom does not promote any kind of peace among men. There's no righteousness, in other words, there's no righteousness to be found there. It's not that the saints don't have a wisdom to speak, though, Paul says right here. We've got a wisdom to speak. We do have a wisdom. Yeah. It's, a, it's a wisdom, all right. It's a high, higher kind of wisdom. Yeah. It's not spoken after the, man, the manner of men. It's wisdom. It's nothing like that at all. It's the wisdom of the saints. It's, it's not uh, from our own thinking. It comes, from, it comes from God, the wisdom that we speak. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of speaking that is after the manner of God. And those who receive it and those who speak it, they're, they're the ones who are being made perfect by it. We're being perfected by the same wisdom. It is a wisdom that has to do with what God is doing. The wisdom is seen in the manner which God is bringing to pass His purpose, His eternal purpose. We see it in salvation, how He's working it out. This is the wisdom of God. A purpose that was ordained. He decided upon this before the world was for our glory. He says, God's manner is not known uh, to the unlearned. It's not something that the, the outsider can pick up and figure out. It's not obvious. God, the wisdom of God is not obvious to the men of the world. Actually, it's a, it's a bit of foolishness, he says. Not even to those who are the world's leaders. Those who are in charge. They, they still can't pick up all this wisdom of God. The smart men, in other words, who lead our countries and things and, and decide uh, things like this. Paul will explain, or he will explain later on in the chapter why this is so. But the wisdom of God is like a secret to the world, isn't it? Hidden. Paul, uh, those on the outside cannot receive it, nor understand it. It's a wisdom that comes from above. Actually, we learn they really don't have any taste for it. They don't have an appetite yeah. for it. So we know really what we can talk to all the time, but really it has to do with our nature, is, doesn't that's, that's really the issue. Paul said if we, if we men would have known, if men of the world, they have known the wisdom of God, they would have never killed Jesus Christ. He calls him the, the prince of glory. They would have never done a thing like this. But they say that this wisdom, what God was doing in salvation, was just outside their grasp. Now, Paul is talking to a people. Now, he's not wasting his breath. Paul is talking to a people who can receive this wisdom. Or he wouldn't be talking this way. Uh, not only can they receive this wisdom, these people are dire straight. They really are. They don't even know it. But uh, the truth is, not only can they receive this wisdom, they've got to have it. Uh, like you receive the wisdom of the world and you're supposed to be receiving the wisdom of God. It's like a lethal thing. Man's way of thinking, the wisdom of the world, well, it will put to death these kind of people uh, the Apostle Paul is talking to. It will put the people of God to death, a slow death. The people of God, we live by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Amen. That's the wisdom of God that He speaks. We live by that. Uh, we've seen it happen too many times. It's too many times we've seen it. We know what the culprit is behind this. We know what the cause is when we look at it. It's too little exposure to the things of God. It's not enough. That's what I'm saying. It's too much, too much exposure to the world and not enough for the things of God. Amen. We're spending too much time, too much time listening to the wrong things, what the world has to say. And, uh, and, and not enough time uh, dwelling on and thinking about the wisdom that comes from God, the things that God has told us. There's, a, there's nothing of this world that's really okay. <laughs> I mean, you can't say this is not so bad. You know, hey, this movie is not really that bad. There's a, I know there's a few cuss words in it, and, and, but it's really a good movie. Now, it's not a real good movie. I'm, I'm, you know, it's, there's not anything good coming from the world. There's nothing. Okay, you just have to see it that way. We can't really, I'm going to tell you what, you can't stress this enough. It's really hard to get a hold of. Now, I ain't talking, I'm talking to a lot of folks, hopefully. I ain't talking to just 
to you primarily. We're talking to everybody. Any exposure to the world is not good. None of it. Even a short visit to its religious institutions is like a poison to the new man. Isn't it? Have you ever? I haven't done it in years. Don't intend to. But if you go and visit there, well, you you got to get over it. I remember going on Sunday, and it took me till Wednesday to get over it. And then I went right back Wednesday, and I was right back again, and it was just this cycle. I was constantly trying to get over it, and I could never amount to anything. And the first part of this chapter, Paul has already stated, I didn't come to you speaking in a way the world does. I didn't. I didn't come that way. And I didn't come to you with the message that comes from other men. Yeah, he made that a point right off the bat, remember? He went to the apostles to confirm what I'm preaching is what you receive from the Lord Jesus. So we're on the same sheet of music. So I didn't come here preaching a bunch of stuff I heard from somebody else. You know, that's, that's a word. And, uh, but I came to you with the message concerning the wisdom of God. This is the focus this morning then. Who are they that speak among themselves the wisdom of God? Who are these people? Who are, the, who are these brethren of God anyway? And they, have they not been equipped? Have they not been equipped to traffic in the things of God, the wisdom of God, which He has made known to them? Would God speak a wisdom to a people that couldn't receive it or live by it or follow it? Well, now the wisdom by, by which the world operates, now we, we've rejected it. We've rejected it. I mean, we don't think like the world thinks. And we, so that consequently, we don't behave like they do. God has revealed the salvation through the gospel message. That's what we've grabbed hold of. His purpose in Christ Jesus has been made to known to us in the gospel. As we, and it's been given to the saints. And this is what we like to expand and talk among ourselves. Paul is speaking to these people, the ones who've embraced the gospel of Jesus. He wants, to see, he wants them to see who they are. And so he says, we got a wisdom and we speak it among those who are perfect. Yeah, that's right. Perfect. Those who are perfect is what he says. Yeah. By definition, I know what we generally define this word to mean. It means complete. Yeah. And it generally means mature, fully mature, and to grow up. Even the verse, be ye perfect, as he is perfect, is generally understood this way. <laughs> but you know... I've learned this. I've learned this. This is something I had to learn. But I think the proper way, really, to define a word is, is, is doctrinally. How is it used? How does the Spirit use the word in the Scripture? Now, I, I used to love word studies. And I do. I still have a preference for them. But not, not nearly as much as I used to. But I let the Scriptures tell me and teach me what does this word mean? Okay. Now, I'm not saying word studies don't have a uh, uh, um, a function. They do. But they should never, like I used to let it, they should never dominate what the doctrine teaches. They should never... That's right. it should, the doctrine of the Scripture should never be submissive to what the Word studies are. And so... Um, but you know, that's the proper way to understand this Word. And that's the way we're going to look at it this morning. Uh, let the, we're going to let the, the Scriptures decide. And uh, now, we... Uh, I want to say this too. The greatest pitfall, I got this wrote down, the greatest pitfall to the modern church, and I believe, I believe this, it has been its academic pursuit yeah. after the things of God. Yeah. Because I'm telling you, it's hard to stay on track. I'm talking about you got to stay focused without being pulled off in the wisdom of men. In an acad I'm not saying you can't do it, but it's pretty tough. Because this, this, this wisdom of men in the academic world is constantly pulling at you. And it's hard. You have to stop sometimes and think, have I been contaminated? It's my focus. Is it still, like, pure? So I, I, I've been there, and that's why I want to say it. The, uh, now, we mentioned it. I asked Brother Given about it. I want to hear what he had to say. But the Pope, now he just quit. Okay, and I'll tell you, that's because he couldn't address the issues, like Brother Gibbons said. And and but I want you to bear in mind that he just wasn't just any old theologian. Okay, the Pope was a German theologian. Well, I'm saying they're known for their academics, particularly in in you know all this original language and things like this. And but he couldn't address. Uh, the problems of the flesh and the sin that's so dominant today. He couldn't do it. He couldn't use. I'm telling you, through the wisdom of the world. Not even a religious wisdom. He couldn't address right. the problem. He quit. 
Okay, Paul didn't try to do it, though, because he knew it was futile. When Paul, when Saul became Paul, when Saul became, uh, when Paul became Saul, he left the wisdom of the world with Saul. Okay, and he went on about his business. And uh, here's a verse to keep in mind while we proceed. This is a condition that God has created now. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, this is written to the same people that it's just written since the second Corinthians, and this is written later on to the same group he's talking to now. We take note of this because it's the same people. This is a word for those who have been called to perfection. Those who are perfect. They have been made righteous. They have been imputed. We talked about this more. The righteousness of God has been imputed to them. We speak a, we speak a wisdom among these people because we're able to. A wisdom that comes from God. Now, this is not an elite group within the people of God, but rather an elite number within the world of men, you see. We're talking about the family of God. Brethren who have been called into the household of God, all of them, they have a unique way of thinking. They're a peculiar bunch. It's a wisdom that comes from God. And so we don't have any problems this morning trying to figure out who, what does Paul mean by perfect here. We speak of wisdom among them that are perfect. And I don't mean mature, complete. I mean perfect. I'm talking about they've been made righteous and they've been made holy. If the wisdom of God is a message for the mature to speak, then what do those who are mature speak, or who are not mature, what do they speak about then? Okay, if this is just for the mature, it, it, it's the wisdom of God, it's just for the clergy, for example, then what do the regular saints talk about? What are they going to talk about, you see? How do the immature ever become mature if this message is not for them then? Well, we know the wisdom of God is for all the brethren, and it, it has something for everyone at every stage of glory. And so I, I, I rejoice in that. So when we talk about one body part being superior to another body part, what we do is we talk about the head. Okay, We make a lot to do about the head of the body. And all the other parts are just body parts, right? But it's the head of the body that, that, that dictates, to, tells us you know, what to do. <clears throat> well, we know the Spirit exhorts us to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And He only exhorts those who can be. These are not foreign words either, brethren. It's just not a brand new thought of Paul. That, uh, for Jesus says in Matthew 5, 48, he, Be ye therefore perfect, yeah. even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. This is a doctrine the Lord brings from heaven. Uh, this is, makes it very clear right here. This is the way God expects men to be. Yeah. Brother Jason said that this morning. This is the way, my, this is the way it's got to be. And, there, and, and, uh, and, and of course God makes a provision for it. There shouldn't be any confusion about that God requires all men to be perfect. Um, now, even though Paul is speaking to those who have been who had the capacity to be this way, uh, God still commands all men in the world, uh, be ye holy, for I am holy. Uh -huh. So on the one hand, you have a clear statement, a command from God for all men to be holy. And on the other, this, this is an exhortation for all men to, to, to pursue this. To seek after it. Uh, it's, like Brother Kevin, I, 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 I make mention, I, it's probably a quote, but it's a sole preoccupation of men to pursue God. That's, that's what they're supposed to be doing, in other words. Well, you know, in our day, we had, do have the vantage point of looking back. Yeah. You know, we can look back. A lot of the brethren that we've been studying here lately can't do that. You know, uh, our brother Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all them, they, they didn't really have anything to look back to. Yeah. They were like, when we talk about pioneers of the faith, <laughs> yeah. or pilgrims or sojourners alone, I mean, they were alone because they didn't have anybody, you know, to, to set to, as an example yeah. or a pattern to follow. Uh, you know, we can look back at this, what Paul's preaching here, and we can see where the devil has set up shop. Yeah. We can see it. You can look back and see yeah. that right off the bat, uh, Satan was really quick to set up a shop here. Right here at this command, be ye perfect or be ye holy. Satan had set up one of his shops. But what he done was, he put out a conflicting message, you see. It wasn't a new message necessarily, but he put out one that conflicted. It opposed what God said. Same thing he'd done in, in the beginning, wasn't it? He didn't come up with something new, he just opposed what God said. 
He's introduced a teaching that opposes what God has said. Uh, it's for those who are having problems with being perfect and being holy. He has a teaching for them. For those, for those who are seeking to be perfect and holy, but they're having trouble with it. He, what he does, he, he's got a teaching that further confuses them in this. We have this view on what the Scripture says. God didn't mean that you must be really like, really like perfect. And, and He really does mean for us to be holy. Satan has led many, many, uh, many men away, uh, countless. He's whipped up at, uh, he's whipped up a delusion uh, for any kind of, uh, any type of different kind of flesh out there. And in, in and I'm talking about in this particular aspect. And uh, his delusions have been uh, carefully crafted. They're deceitful in nature. They've been carefully crafted to uh, to snare men, you know, who are in pursuit. Are actually. Men who are in pursuit, serious and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, well-meaning brethren, who would I, in the beginning for sure we could say for sure they set out in this pursuit for God and and this and this right they want to be this way they want to live this, but He snared them with these kind of teachings and uh and He's and He's put false teachers out there and He's and He's put these teachings in their mouths so they can teach them and uh, just like Paul said was going to happen. Mm -hmm. That's why we must stand up and preach these things. Mm -hmm. You know, if a person embraces a kind of teaching like this, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but, you know, when they embrace something like this, well, then this, this puts their, their uh, progress in the kingdom of God. That stops them. It puts, their, it puts salvation, it brings salvation to a grinding halt. Mm -hmm. You can't make any progress if you get all wrapped up in some kind of misinformation like this. Mm -hmm. The things of God, men cannot accomplish them of themselves. Uh -huh. and, and salvation is an impossibility for man to achieve. It really is. Mm -hmm. Men cannot do it, mm -hmm. like be perfect and be holy. They can't do it on themselves. Yeah. And the evidence is all around us that, that, that men can't do it. We said it before, salvation is not a kind of thing a man can figure out. That's why... Uh, that's why they believe it can't be perfect. You know, they come to this thinking. And many others have just quit calling themselves saints. They don't even call themselves saints, which means holy anymore. Okay? They just don't even do it. They call each other Christians, and they, they go by a name that they were called, that the world called them. And that's what they refer to themselves as. They got this, picked up this idea that we're just all sinners. You know? And, uh, and for someone to get up and speak against this, that say, we're not all just sinners. Mm -hmm. For someone to get up and, and preach against this, well, they, 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 they think you, if you start talk, talking about the perfect will of God and God's perfect eternal purpose and, and He's given it, He's given it to a holy people, a people He's made holy and perfect, why well, they, they think you some kind of a nut. They, they, look, they look at you and they just stand there and look at you like that. They, they just they can't receive it, in other words. But we know that Jesus would never tell someone, go and sin no more, if that, that was impossible. Right. If, he wouldn't, if He wouldn't give them some kind of provision to do it. The Apostle Peter would never refer to the saints as holy, a holy nation, if they really weren't, were, they were not. The Apostle Peter would never, uh, and the Scriptures would, would not consistently call the people of God saints if they were not really saints. And, uh, and it would not be said that the people of God handled holy things if there was no such a thing. Yeah. So, so it's all consistent throughout the Scriptures. Amen. Uh, so we hear today, practically the whole religious world, they'll, they'll speak that, they'll tell you, now you know, only God and only the Lord Jesus Christ can be perfect. And, and that is true. That's where we get it from. How can... How can we, uh, and they'll say, we can all, we can, we're going to work to get as close as we can, but we never can be. So they're, they're shot down right, right from the right beginning. Uh, now this is all of God. I want you, what we're seeing, what Paul is talking about, being holy and being perfect 
and God in Christ Jesus. This is a work of God. Where he's talking about the wisdom of God. It's what he's talking about. It's, it's the incredible uh, wisdom that's in his salvation that the people of God can see after they come into the kingdom of God. It's the, it's the wisdom of God in a, in a mystery. It's the, even the wisdom hidden of God that was ordained. That, that's what this is about. That he has made men righteous. And that he has made men holy. This is the, this is the wisdom in it. It's, it's hid by the foolishness of man's wisdom. He makes men holy. See, this is the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God. That Jesus is perfect and righteous. He's a righteous and perfect man. He's able to save all them that come to him. This is the wisdom of God. That his righteousness... That God's righteousness can be imputed to those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. His wisdom. How many really believe? How many really believe they're going to be in glory because they were worthy to be there? Hmm? That they've been made right. And it's right they be there, you see. Amen. To be counted worthy. It, that, that's, a, that's a foundational uh, teaching, a doctrine in the Scriptures. That to be worthy of, of the blessings of God. We don't start out that way, but God makes us this way. Those who in Sardis are told, they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Thou hast a few names in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. There's like too many, there's, there's a big thing out there, there's too many people think they're going to get the glory <coughs> by, with someone else, through someone else. That uh, even, even if, if they think that even if a man comes to Jesus, and no matter how they live, you know, there's some things that's completely off limits, but generally, it don't matter how they live, you know, uh, that they're going to get to glory. Because Jesus was perfect, and He died for all men. Now, that's, that's, what, they, that's what they think. And, we, and we'll agree with them to a point. We will say, well, Jesus did come. So that man could have salvation because he was he could do he could do those things that pleased the Father. We'll agree with them. It's true that Jesus was sinless. And 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 for this reason, he's a covering for our sins. We can agree with them that far. And the salvation that God brings in Christ Jesus, you know, we got we we, we want we want to talk to them about how this is accomplished mm -hmm. in a man. This the salvation that Jesus Christ brings. <laughs> Okay, that he is able to bring. We want to talk to him. How is this? But how is this accomplished in a man? You want to talk to him about that? Now, Nicodemus is a good example of this. He's a man that came to Jesus. Okay, that was a good thing. He came to Jesus first, and that's what you got to do. You got to come to Jesus first, and you got to intend on staying. But now we know that a man who comes to Jesus, bear with me a little bit, we know that a man who comes to Jesus, now if he intends on staying, something's, some kind of work's got to be done. Yeah. Right? Because a man can't, Jesus can't receive anybody and let them stay if they're like unclean and unholy and unrighteous. They can't stay that way. So we want to stay with the Lord. We want to do whatever it takes to stay there. But it's quite an impossible task, you see, if God were not involved. Matter of fact, you know, uh, we can never ever hope to go into the presence of God if, if we have not seen after this. That if we haven't taken the time nor the effort to know the Lord... And for the Lord to know us, yes. okay. <clears throat> Ever mindful of our our uh, our nature and how we're supposed to be in His presence. No man can ever merit the possibilities of the promises of God and the blessings of God. No amount of work, you see, can can make us uh, live up to that expectation. Now. Earlier I said no man can stay with Jesus unless they're holy and perfect and righteous like He is. But no man comes to Jesus that way, do they? There's not one righteous, not one. So something has to be done at the very beginning. Some work of God has had to happen so that, uh, that we can remain in the presence of the Lord and so that we can be in fellowship with Him. God has got to change us. So that we can be clean and pure and remain with Him. 
That's after we come, that we can stay. Now, we're talking about a people that speak and think like God. And we're talking about how has this come about. How, how can you talk about somebody being perfect and holy to begin with? And that we're getting to that, you see. We're talking about how we're made to be that way. We know it certainly isn't from our own efforts of the flesh. That was, that was told to us. We learned that. We can't do it. So uh, God does something. And, it, he, and we, he tells us all about it. It's a wonderful account there in John 3. When we talked about Nicodemus already. When Nicodemus came to Jesus. You know, that's why Jesus, I, I, I finally seen it. Pretty clear. That's why Jesus abruptly just jumped right to it. He said, well, I, if I'm going to talk to Nicodemus about these things, then i got to get him where he can hear them. i got to get him where he can receive them. So right off the bat, Okay, he goes after the real issue. The real issue of men and the kingdom of God. Jesus answers Nicodemus' question before he answers. Ask it. Because he, he knew that Nicodemus had the right heart. He told Nicodemus, a man must be born again. For a man could come to stay. That's other words. He must be born again. So then you know, see, God does a work right off the bat, doesn't he? He puts, he puts men in Christ Jesus. He cleans them up. And he makes them pure, clean, and righteous. He puts them in uh, the flock of God, Jesus Christ. Everybody in the flock of God, under Jesus' care, they've been made brand new, you see. They've been made clean and righteous and holy and pure. Now this birth that uh, Jesus was telling Nicodemus about, it's superior to our birth in this world because this birth that Jesus is talking about don't have anything to do with Adam or another human being other than the mother. But you understand what I'm saying? It, it, the seed of Adam has nothing to do with this at all. It's all of God. We were born of our human mothers. We were initially, when, when we came from out of the womb, we were clean and sinless. We even had that baby smell. You know, holding baby, ooh, they smell good. And, we, uh, but, and when, we, when we're born again, by the operation of God, we're made that same way again. We're again made clean and sinless. That's exactly how we come in the presence of the Lord. Amen. And, and, but in order to stay there in Jesus' presence, we got, we got to stay that way, the way we were. And provisions have been made now to stay that way. So we can remain. And, and, that, and that's the way we'll be, brethren, when the Lord comes back. Or until we, till death do us part, one or the other. Mm -hmm. You know what? I asked myself. I asked you these these questions too. What's and you'll be able to answer these. These are easy. What sense does it make to be born again? Have our sins <coughs> washed away? Our conscience cleaned by the blood of Christ? What would be the purpose of that if it were accept, acceptable or expected that men should return again to be defiled and return to what they previously were? What would be the purpose of all that? That sounds like a simplistic question, doesn't it? But you know, you got the reason in this way. Uh, Jesus said, I come that men may have life and have it more abundantly too. In this same chapter, John 3, that same chapter right on further on, Jesus spends quite a bit of time uh, to tell his purpose for coming into the earth. He, gives, he really does give Nicodemus a good, a good discussion that night. He, he really starts at the beginning, man must be born again, and he gives him you know, a real good basic understanding of the kingdom of God. And, uh, and, 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 and it's in the scripture here, Jesus, he goes back to Moses. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus did not come to condemn the world. It was already condemned. We know this. He came to save the world. And those who remain in this world, well, they stay condemned. Jesus came to save this lost world. And the facts are, we are saved by the Lord. And no one can say they've been saved until they get to glory and that the Lord has taken them there. And in the meanwhile, no one can, can, be say, can say, I'm being saved, who are not in fellowship with Him. Amen. Jesus, is, He's a perfect and holy one. And those who are in fellowship with Him must be too. They, they've been made holy, and through our connection to Him, we remain a holy people. 
It's very hard to find anybody that can talk to you about these things anymore if you're out and about and you, you run up on somebody that goes somewhere and you start talking about these things and we talk about it pretty freely among ourselves and you'll find out real quick they really can't talk too much about them and you'll find out or you'll learn that it's because their mind's been cluttered up. I'm sorry I have to say this again, but you'll find out that their mind's been cluttered up with a lot of other stuff that men teach. <laughs> At, really, you know, they, they can tell you all about other things, but to really get down to the, the essential fundamental doctrines of the Lord, they can't discuss them. And so, but, and, and so then our exhortation today then would be to, uh, to have an understanding of the Scriptures where the, where the whole body, where all the Scriptures, are they, they're harmonious and they complement one another and they're consistent. Uh, I, want to, I want to exhort everybody you know, uh, and every, everyone to, to stand on guard or, or, or to make it a point that we don't receive any kind of teaching that uh, puts the Scriptures like right here and then this teaching that, that's being taught is up here. It should never be this way, that the, the teaching of man or, or some kind of doctrine would be superior and, or the teaching of God would be submissive uh, to, uh, to what a man would teach, in other words. Amen. We, you know, I, I've seen it happen that uh, there, there's uh, men who will actually skip over large texts of Scripture uh, in favor of other Scripture because they, kind of, they, they fit better with what, what, we, what the group believes. But all of it, all of Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And in, in this account, in 1 John 3, 9, whoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. You see what I've done, don't you? I've taken what I've been talking about, and because Scripture is consistent and harmonious, we're able to take this Scripture in 1 John, and we're... We're leaning right in, and we don't have any kind of like problems with that, you see. Because we know that the people of God have been born again, that the seed of God remains in them. Uh, so to have any kind of teaching that obscures or makes somebody overlook this passage I just read in 1 John, well, you know, that's not good. Actually, I believe it'll, it'll disconnect you from the greater body of truth, if, you, if I can say it that way. <clears throat> well, I'm going to wrap this up here in a few minutes. But what I wanted to say was that uh, it's, it's a bad thing we got on our hands today, but we've Paul seen it coming. But uh, because of deceitfulness and uh, uh, the devil has raised up men among your own number, Paul said, they'll come in and teach perverse things. Uh, a lot of religious people have no understanding of the new birth, probably none at all. They'll talk about being born again and everything like that, but they really don't understand a lot of it. Uh, it's not their fault. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not really criticizing them. I'm criticizing the one who has fabricated the deceit and those who preach it to promote an agenda of themselves. That's how I criticize them, but those who are in error and really are seeking God, I don't criticize them. They have no idea. These brothers I'm talking, they have no idea what it really means to crucify the flesh because they're, they're in a left field about these other things. To mortify the deeds of the body, they don't understand this. And to walk in the Spirit, to walk in newness of life, to put on the new man, they don't understand them. They have no idea what these things really mean. They just skip over them and they don't deal with them. Romans 7, now that could be understood. That, could, that ain't that hard to understand. I tell you why it's so hard to understand. And brethren, just skip over and preachers don't preach it. It's because they've, they've, they've received something else. And it prevents them from seeing what's being taught in Romans 7. Men are already wrong about some other things. They just, this, Romans 7 conflicts with it, you see. But Jesus put the church on watch. Be on guard. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Now, just as soon as you come into the kingdom of God, the things of God start clearing up, don't they? That's common knowledge. That's once you come into the family, then we, the family of God, we begin to prefer them and not to prefer other things. We have an affection for good and wholesome things of God then. We have an appetite for it. We have a desire for the Word of God. We don't hear, we really want to hear anything else. We want to know what it means. And, uh, we want to know what, we want to understand it. And we, we, under, we have an, an undercurrent of joy 
and thankfulness to God. It's always present with us. And it kind of, I thought of myself, it kind of like, up, it kind of peaks. You know, when you, it, it, it comes up to a peak like a graph or a peak. When, when you get something again, and it'll peak this joy and this thankfulness, it'll peak. But it's always running in the background yeah. there, this, this joy and thankfulness. It's, this is in the peak, people of God. And, uh, <laughs> and so it happens among them, you see, those who have received the wisdom of God and they've rejected the wisdom of men. The, point, the whole point, if you don't get anything else of what I said was, is that the wisdom of men well, conflicts and opposes the wisdom of God and that we got to, can't receive any of it. Now, the point that Paul is beginning to develop here is that there's a wisdom that can only be received by those who belong to the kingdom of God. Amen. Paul tells them we speak that wisdom among them. And it's not a wisdom that belongs to the world at all. This wisdom of which Paul speaks is what God gives. He gives it to the saints. They're called out by this wisdom. And it's for this wisdom they live. It is a wisdom that God brings, that it's a wisdom that God brings through his salvation. And it, it will fully complement the glory of God. Amen. Now, the recreation in Christ Jesus is nothing like what is being portrayed in the religious world, being born again after the Spirit. Paul referred to the new man, which is, which is after God created and true holiness and righteousness, by the way. In other places, it's a new create creature. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, things are become new. What he said there was, when we take this new thing, then the old thing is gone, passed away. We get a brand new creature that takes the place of the old. I mean, he's not gone, but he replaces his dominant role. He don't That's dictate right. no more. That's he don't right. talk. He tries to talk. But we tell him, go sit down. <laughs> the new creation, he's not a cleaned up version of the old man. He's not stronger or smarter. He's a new man in Christ Jesus. He's crea created after the image of God. <clears throat> Brethren, he has a nature about him. It puts him outside the possibilities of failure. When you're walking in the Spirit, we talk about this. When you're walking in the Spirit after the things of God, then you, the sinning is the furthest thing from your mind. Amen. Okay? It's when you, when, you, when you get close to some kind of something, and I don't, then that's when Satan can nip, nip at you. Right. You know, that's why, we, that's why we're exhorted. And you know, we couldn't do that if we, we, if we, wouldn't ha if we, if we hadn't been given a new man. You didn't talk this way to the Israelites, did he? He said, I'm, I'm going to do a new thing. And this is what we have. He is the one to whom the wisdom of God has been directed. The old man, he cannot receive the things of God. Only the new man can deal in the pure and gentle wisdom of God. That which is peaceful and gentle. He's easily entreated. He's willing to submit. We talked about this yes. in our lesson, didn't we? He's easily entreated. To submit. He's easily, he's, he's, he's willing to submit and yield. Full of mercy and good fruits. He's not partial. She doesn't show partiality. He's not a hypocrite. And, uh, you know, we can identify. This helps us too, really. If anytime we see some kind of something like this, well, we know where it comes from, don't we? Well, brother, and I, this is an exhortation for us to. This, to Raise up our force field a little bit to uh, be on guard against the world. Anything that uh, would come in. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to say this, that uh, Paul declares that the wisdom the saint speaks is a wisdom that, will, that was once hid from men by God. All men. It was hid from all men. It's still hid by a great portion, yeah. but it's, it shouldn't have to be because God's made it known. Right. It has been made known, Paul said. Mm -hmm. The mystery of God's salvation, a thing Peter says the prophets inquired and diligently searched for. Yeah. Can I read this to you real quick? Mm -hmm. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you? Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ what, which was in them did signify 
when it testified beforehand the sufferance of Christ and the glory that should follow to the wisdom of God, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister these things which are now reported among you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desired to look unto, in whom are all are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge Amen. made known to the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Well, the next time we get together, we'll finish up this chapter if the Lord tarries, and he's gonna, Paul's gonna, he's gonna go on to tell us exactly why it's this way, and it's been calculated by God. So as he, he's he's engineered it, so to speak, so that uh, it's hid from the world but it's made known to those who are in Christ Jesus. Thank you, brethren.